You are listening to The Addiction Files, where we discuss evidence-based treatment, clinical pearls and resources, while striving to destigmatize the treatment of addiction in our medical culture and save lives. We are the addiction doctors, Dr. Darlene Peterson and Paula Cook. Welcome to The Addiction Files. We are back with a fantastic episode. We have Dr. Lucinda Grandy joining us, and we are going to talk about the use of ketamine for buprenorphine initiation. And this is such a fascinating topic, so we were really excited to get started. Dr. Paula Cook is going to introduce Dr. Grande to us, and then we are going to get started. Great. Yeah, thank you. So Lucinda Grande, MD, is a partner at Pioneer Family Practice in Lacey, Washington, where she practices primary care. She's board certified in family medicine and addiction medicine and has an additional focus on the treatment of chronic pain. She advocates for improved access to opioid treatment medications and marginalized populations and also for patients who depend on prescribed opioid medications to manage chronic pain. Dr. Grandy's work with ketamine was stimulated during her early training in anesthesiology, where she observed an extraordinary response to a low-dose infusion of ketamine in a hospitalized patient with severe acute pain. Beginning in 2012, she began to explore the use of ultra-low-dose oral ketamine for treatment of chronic pain and depression in the outpatient setting. And this sub-dissociative dose range, also known as microdosing, results in no alteration of cognition. And in 2022, she learned about Dr. Andrew Herring's use of a ketamine infusion to terminate buprenorphine precipitated opioid withdrawal in the emergency department of Highland Hospital in Oakland, California. Having treated over 500 clinic patients by then with ultra-low-dose ketamine, she then allied with the team of Dr. Tom Hutch of We Care Daily Clinics in Auburn, Washington, to explore the use of sub-dissociative doses of oral ketamine to treat or prevent oral excuse me, opioid withdrawal in patients dependent on illicit fentanyl or methadone. They prescribed ketamine to 37 patients, and of the last 16 patients, 75% successfully transitioned to buprenorphine treatment. Publication of these results is anticipated for this year, 2024, and Dr. Grandy has advocated for increased access to medication treatment for opioid use disorder via her pioneering clinical work and through work with organized medicine legislators and government agencies in the media and in peer-reviewed journals. She's illuminated the benefits of low-barrier buprenorphine clinics, treatment for the incarcerated, buprenorphine without naloxone, eliminating buprenorphine dose limits and the buprenorphine waiver, and modernizing access to methadone treatment. Dr. Grandy's medical degree is from the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle. She completed her family medicine residency at St. Peter Family Medicine in Olympia, Washington. She's a clinical assistant professor in the University of Washington School of Medicine, Department of Family Medicine. And that's a great introduction. It's so exciting to talk to you about your lengthy experience doing this, especially since we're all more and more engaged with people using fentanyl and having more and more difficulty transitioning to buprenorphine. And so, you know, Darlene and I both attended CSAM and heard you present on this topic, Dr. Granny, and we were just captivated. And I immediately was texting my clinical staff, like, we've got to do this. We've got to get this going. This is going to be so helpful and important. So we're very grateful that you're here to join us and talk to us about your findings and your experience. And so please just go ahead and and impart your knowledge. Well, thank you very much, Darlene and Paula. That's um, really a a wonderful introduction. I appreciate that. I appreciate being invited to participate on this program. The title of this um, part of the presentation um, is Ketamine-Assisted Buprenorphine Initiation. Um, So I have a lot of people that I'd like to acknowledge most from. So ketamine-assisted buprenorphine initiation, um, the concept is somebody that's on fentanyl, um, you give them buprenorphine and ketamine um, in some combination over some period of time, and they end up stable on buprenorphine, whether it's buprenorphine or uh, the combination buprenorphine naloxone. Um, So ketamine is actually the, the active ingredient in that transition. 
Um, we've talked about my background, um, but just uh, high, highlighting um, some of the important points. I am board certified in family medicine and addiction medicine. I have two years of anesthesiology training, which was really helpful for me in understanding ketamine and how it, what its actual safety profile is, even when it's used at much higher doses than what I use. Um, and it, it's an incredibly safe medicine. Um, the research um, literature includes a um, report of somebody who accidentally gave their patient 10 times the amount that they were supposed to give for anesthesia. And the person came out fine. They just stayed in anesthesia a whole lot longer than they otherwise would have. And they came out fine. And so it's just, it's a very safe medicine. Um, so I've been pres prescribing ketamine for 12 years um, at the sub-dissociative dose level, primarily with chronic pain patients and more recently, specifically with patients who have depression um, and no pain. And many patients have that overlap between the two of those. Um, and also prescribing 12 uh, for 12 years, um, prescribing buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. And in the introduction, it was discussed the um, interest I have in um, advancing use of it in all different ways and overcoming barriers. Um, and uh, the most I learned about buprenorphine was as co-founder and medical director for three years of a low threshold buprenorphine clinic in Olympia, Washington. And that is really the the people that really need it the most are the ones that have the hardest time getting a hold of it. And I got a real good flavor of what how what people are dealing with on a day to day basis and the suffering and that suffering that's happening out there. Um, so ketamine, the dose that I use for um, primarily in the in the outpatient setting and that, that I'm using in this um, application is about 5% of the anesthetic dose. In um, anesthesia, they will use, they describe it in milligrams per kilogram, and the range typically is one to two milligrams per kilogram intravenous. Um, there is also a very large uh, group of people who are prescribing or uh, administering ketamine intravenously specifically to treat depression. And there's a very large literature now over the past 20 years um, showing really, uh, astonishing degree of success in rapid re, um, improvement in recovery from depression um, using a single infusion. And uh, the, the protocol that they use now is um, they will do it over two weeks, about six infusions. Um, and that is about 50% of the anesthetic dose. And the dose I use is about 5% of the anesthetic dose. And it's um, at the 50% level that's used for depression, people go into a state of um, altered consciousness that is um, somewhat like a psychedelic trip that people might get from, um, from LSD or psilocybin. Um, in the dose that I use, it's below that level so that you don't, ideally, I start people at such a low dose that they don't feel anything. They think it's just a placebo and um, increasing the dose a little bit at a time until they get some kind of a benefit. Um, it, without having um, the cognitive impair, impairment or um, in, impact at all. Um, and so in this application of ketamine-assisted BUP initiation, nobody, there's one patient who actually took, no, two patients, who took a large amount of it in a short period of time, and they did get into that psychedelic dissociated state. Uh, and for one of them, it was very pleasurable because he's used a lot of drugs and he thought that was just fine. And the other one was terrified because ketamine is, uh, if you're not expecting to have a, a psychedelic trip and then you have it, um, it can really go bad. And that's what happened with him. And so that I would really, anybody that wants to do this, I would really encourage you to let people know they should not be taking more than the amount that you prescribe because it can be very, um, very disruptive to their life. It's not, it won't last that long. It lasts about 15 or 20 minutes if they get into a state like that. Um, and they'll be completely unharmed unless they go swimming and drown or something like Matthew Perry did. Um, but other than that, it's completely harmless. Um, but uh, ideally, they'll be using these really tiny doses. Um, and just to give an example of, um, I did an analysis of uh, the patients <clears throat> that I prescribed ketamine to between 2018 and 2022. 
And uh, this was uh, us using data from the um, Peninsula Compounding Pharmacy, um, they, uh, that, which is where I do m probably three quarters of my prescribing. And during that five-year period, there were 102 patients and um, 20, about half of them um, actually were uh, on under 100 milligrams per day. And that's divided doses so that each dose may be 16 to 32 milligrams, which is low enough that they wouldn't have any dissociative effect. And the dosing goes up as high as, in some cases, uh, over 300 milligrams. That, but that's a very small number of people that are using that much. So after reading um, Andrew Herring's paper, which is called um, Hylosian, is actually the first author on that, about using ketamine to help people deal with precipitated withdrawal, I had an opportunity to give it a try when um, somebody that I know of, a professional colleague, had a daughter who had been started on buprenorphine the previous day and was having a terrible experience, a terrible precipitated withdrawal, and she wanted some help. And so she called me and I thought, oh, maybe this is a good situation to try the ketamine. It might end her precipitated withdrawal. And I was able to get her um, some buprenorphine, some ketamine um, within, um, by the next day, she had been in, in a really severe withdrawal for 18 hours and was really miserable lying on the bed and moaning um, and rolling around. And uh, literally after five minutes of five minutes after her first dose of ketamine, she took only a quarter of the amount that I had I had recommended. She took only four milligrams and she was com completely resolved of her symptoms. And she was up walking and she was cheerful and talking. And I talked to her on the phone. It was literally about five minutes after she had taken her ketamine. And she was, you know, pretty blase about it all. Like, oh, yeah, I'm fine whatever, as if it was nothing. And that was just such a, an exciting event that four milligrams sublingual could terminate a terrible precipitated withdrawal. Um, so that was like, okay, this is something that definitely needs to be explored more. Um, so I reached out to various colleagues that might, but I'm not at the Olympia Bupe Clinic anymore. And so I don't have access to those patients. So I reached out to other um, providers of uh, medical directors at other clinics that might possibly be interested in offering this kind of treatment to their patients. And Tom Hutch of We Care Daily Clinics um, was interested. Um, it's a methadone clinic, and most of the people that go there really are interested in methadone. But some people say, well, they'd really rather be on Suboxone or buprenorphine, um, but it's they're worried about precipitated withdrawal. And so they'll um, settle for methadone, but now the people in on Tom's team, the um, PAs and the nurse practitioners, were, were able to tell people, well, if you really do want to be on buprenorphine, then maybe you can try this strategy that uses ketamine, and will. Um, and so they sent me um, as a referral. They um, they referred me as a um, was the consultant, um, and would talk with the patients. Most of these patients I interviewed by telephone. Um, and I only met a few of them in this first batch um, in person. Um, but that's all you just and I don't need to know a lot about them. Um, but when I, I did like a baseline introductory um, discussion with them to learn a little bit about their background and to tell them a little bit about the treatment <clears throat> and um, was able to get. Oh, th this is important. The hardest part of it is how do you get the ketamine to the patient? Um, because it's not something that you can just write a prescription for at any pharmacy. It is only available at compounding pharmacies. There's no drug company that makes it in a convenient pill form that you can buy off the shelf. Um, it's not very expensive. Um, and if the patients that I've been working with over, over the years, um, it's typically about $50 a month for the entire amount that they use. Um, but a very small amount, most pharmacies aren't anxious to, to sell uh, cre create a batch of, of ketamine to sell a very small amount for just this, you know, several day period. Um, but we were able to make arrangements with a pharmacy in Kent, uh, Washington, um, who had, he, he prepared a batch of trochies. Um, trochies are little waxy squares of ketamine uh, that the person puts under their tongue. Um, and it takes uh, a couple of days to make um, a batch of them. So we had him asked him if 
if he would be available to do this for a lot of patients, we'd probably be able to um, use 300 of them over some period of time. Um, and maybe he could give us a, a bargain. So he did. He made up a, a big batch of 16 milligram trochies and uh, agreed to sell them um, to our patients for $20. Actually, it was originally $15 for four ketamine trophies because that's kind of what I thought it might be. And ultimately, I now prescribe eight of them to each person, and that's $20. Um, and there's a number of other pharmacies I was able to um, get it at a fairly good price for um, for the eight trophies, but I had to explain what I was up to and why I wanted that low price. And a lot of a lot of people who run compounding pharmacies really are community oriented and are willing to um, to make a deal for a situation when you know I'm paying for it myself. The patient, these patients don't have enough money to buy that, and they get insurance coverage for all their regular medicines, but the insurance will not cover the ketamine. And I was I was paying for that, so I wanted to keep the price as low as possible. Um, ultimately, We Care Daily Clinics um, decided that, that this was a project worth um, committing some money to, and they agreed to take over the thing for the ketamine at that, for their patients. So uh, I would talk with the patients every day, and also the team of nurse practitioners and the PA at the, um, at the clinic uh, would also be talking with the patients or texting with them. Um, almost every day, some, sometimes every day. And then we talk with each other. So it was kind of a team. team. So the outcomes uh, we saw, uh, I prescribed it to 37 patients between May 2022 and July of 2023. Uh, and that was 22 females and 15 males, ages 19 to 62. And there were actually two patients who were on, um, they were transitioning from fentanyl to methadone and they were running into, well, withdrawal. It wasn't precipitated withdrawal, but it was, they couldn't get onto the methadone fast enough and they were having a miserable fentanyl withdrawal. And uh, Tom asked me if I might be willing to try the ketamine to help that person and the first person, and I did, and it worked great. And, and she, one dose of the ketamine and she, her withdrawal was, was resolved and she was just much more comfortable. It, it took several doses for her before she was, um, uh, over the course of two or three days before she was stable on the dose of methadone she was aiming for. And then another one came along and it was like, oh, okay, now we know how to do it. So if anybody uh, for anybody that's listening to this, if you are working at a methadone clinic, you probably can't prescribe ketamine because you're not legally allowed to, but you might be somebody who partners up with a methadone clinic and um, can provide that service to their patients. So of the 37 patients that I prescribed it to, 24 of them actually tried it and reported back. Um, I was able to determine um, that there some of the other people had picked it up at the pharmacy. I looked at the prescription monitoring program and it showed that the, it had been dispensed, but the person never uh, responded to me. Um, but 24 of them did try it and they let me know how it went. Uh, by the time I got towards the last um, 16 of those 24, I had really kind of narrowed it down to a, a system that was working pretty well um, for a lot of people. It's still being tweaking and trying, um, I don't mean tweaking like using meth, but um, tweaking the method, uh, fine tuning it. Um, and 12 of the last 16 people made it all the way through initiation to um, become stable on buprenorphine, which I think is a higher rate than other methods that are being used out there. there there's microdosing, macrodosing, um, the quick start, which is the naloxone induced. Um, it, actually, that probably has a, a pretty high success rate because it, the person, well, I guess somebody could give up after they've given themselves naloxone and get so miserable, they just leave the clinic screaming and go get some fentanyl to, to help them with their withdrawal symptoms. But, but many people, if they're motivated enough to do that, um, then, uh, then they're probably going to make it through their initiation. So that quick start strategy, if you haven't heard about it, it's um, a very... Uh, progressive idea, somebody's got to give themselves naloxone and generate a precipitated withdrawal and, and then sudden, and then give themselves a large amount of buprenorphine, 24 milligrams all at once, and they get over their precipitated withdrawal within 45 minutes and are, become stable on 
on buprenorphine within that first day, which is astonishing. And that it's a rare person that's willing to try it, but those who try it will pretty much always succeed. Um, anyway, so that my rate of the 75% success rate was is pretty good, I think, compared to what is happening out there in um, at clinics these days with people trying to transition from fentanyl. It's such, it's like a black hole. It's so hard for people to get out of. Um, and then the, the most surprising news and really rewarding is that of the people that did make it through to stable use of buprenorphine, 92% of them, 11 out of the 12, actually were still in communication in um, some form of treatment after 30 days. And that's like an amazing retention rate. I don't know how many of them stayed on it because fentanyl is like a strong magnet and can pull people back again. So the key discoveries that we made during this process were that ketamine is useful during buprenorphine initiation in three different ways. Um, and I think the most important way is that it treats fentanyl withdrawal, um, which is quite a miserable experience for people. <clears throat> and um, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but if the person does nothing while they're withdrawing from fentanyl, if they never use fentanyl again and they only use buprenor only use ketamine, then a large part of their withdrawal symptoms will be uh, erased. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but um, I also use clonazepam now as part of my routine um, strategy because the one piece that's sometimes left after uh, somebody uses ketamine they're still, um, they can have intense anxiety. And there was a number of patients that just got, fell off the track just because their anxiety was so intense that they couldn't stand it. And other than that, they didn't have any um, like sore muscles or stomach upset um, or bone pain or um, restless legs or any of those kinds of things. That was all better, but the anxiety was unbearable. Um, and I found that using clonazepam, one milligram a day for most people is adequate to keep that under control and keep people from having a panic attack and allow them to continue forward. So the combination of the ketamine and the, and the buprenorphine, I'm sorry, the ketamine and the, and, the, um, and the clonazepam are just a magic combination that allow people to go. I had one patient last week who went for six days without, she had a few other, like a little bit of clonidine and gabapentin. And she actually had a, a couple tablets of um, oxycodone available from a previous prescription. And she said that none of those really helped that much. She did use them a little, but what really made the difference was the combination of the ketamine and clonazepam for six days. And she was so terrified of precipitated withdrawal. She didn't want to try the bute until day seven. And by day seven, there was no precipitated withdrawal. She was able to start it right up and um, got stable on that, on buprenorphine that day. So that, for me, it was like this thing, it works not only on the first day, but it can work for six days if you want to have, if you have the patience to stretch it out that long before you get onto the buprenorphine. So it treats fentanyl withdrawal. It also prevents uh, buprenorphine precipitated opioid withdrawal. Um, if, you, if you take it before uh, the, a dose of buprenorphine, it's not 100% reliable. Um, but it, it will definitely dampen the effect. In some cases, it can prevent it. Um, and also, if you do have buprenorphine precipitated opioid withdrawal, um, then you can dampen the effect of it by taking ketamine afterwards, like we saw with that patient number one, which was an extreme example. It doesn't usually work quite as well as that. Um, but people, for people who have been in withdrawal for a really long time, I think that they're really ready for a very small dose of ketamine that can that can wipe it out. Another of the major discoveries was that 16 milligrams sublingual works most of the time. And there's of all the people that I, I worked with, they did get some relief at that level. And some pe people got profound relief. Some people only got a little bit of relief, but that's all they needed. They didn't need to have a dissociative level dose to go up to um, 50 milligrams or any, uh, up to 16, if you go up to 32 milligrams, um, you pretty much can avoid dissociation, that um, state of um, kind of a psychedelic drunk trip-like state. Um, but anything higher than that, you're going to get that those cognitive effects. 
Um, and I'm not sure that there's really any advantage as far as precipitated withdrawal by increasing the dose. It, do, it doesn't seem to me that if somebody doesn't get a response at 16 milligrams, they're probably not going to get a response at any dose higher than that, unless they go into the really high dose range that um, people are using in the emergency department. Um, so uh, another key discovery was that anxiety, like I was mentioning, um, anxiety is not prevented by ketamine. Um, that's the one one part of withdrawal that is a horrible part of withdrawal um, that you really need to have something else and a benzodiazepine um, really hits the spot. Another thing that's really important, and I, I don't know exactly how to quantify this, but I think that daily guidance and encouragement and support from a provider is essential because it's a really hard thing for somebody to go through this transition process. And um, people that are in this position to, in the first place, a lot of times don't have a lot of um, the internal stability that it takes to stick with something despite um, challenges. Um, and so it, it takes a, it's a really hard job for somebody to, to go through that process. And if they have really good support, usually somebody that they're at home with, somebody, somebody there with them to help, and also having the provider talk with them every day and given a recommendation, okay, what's the next thing you should do? Um, for, for the people that I was starting buprenorphine early on, uh, the challenge was, okay, are they ready for a small dose of buprenorphine or should we stick with the ketamine and how much should they take and when should they take it? Those kinds of things, having somebody to talk with about that is really helpful rather than letting people just kind of figure it out on their own. Um, so the learning process, um, I think was a really interesting experiment. I mean, it was like, it, it's not like you write a prescription for Prozac and they take it every day and, and their depression is relieved. It's just not as simple as that. It was like, how do you use this powerful, wonderful tool in a way that actually works for most people? And um, it was not obvious at first. Um, and the first thing we learned was that it was for people that were going to take buprenorphine on day uh, two or three, or if they were doing microdosing and they were taking a little bit every day, um, they should take the ketamine before the uh, before the buprenorphine rather than wait until they had withdrawal afterwards. Um, and then it was a much more comfortable experience for them and it would prevent or really dampen the effect of um, withdrawal. And then another thing was the microdosing that was going on for 10 days, at least half the people couldn't make it through that. They they lost their oomph. And it was also really taxing for me to be talking with people every single day through this you know, really draining process. Um, so a shorter induction duration was uh, really optimal. And uh, lesson number three, this is the thing I think was the most important insight was that people really needed to stop fentanyl because as long as they continued using fentanyl through that transition, they're going to continue to have uh, withdrawal and or some challenging feeling icky is how people describe it. <clears throat> and if they use ketamine instead of fentanyl, when they have fentanyl withdrawal, it works just as well and they are getting free of the fentanyl. And everyone who followed this rule completed initiation. So that was that was the key learning point. Um, so uh, lesson four was to use a benzo, and I already described that, that people were having panic attacks and that was derailing them. And with I lost them, they wouldn't, they wouldn't come back. Just routinely do the clonazepam. It raises eyebrows when I tell people about it because benzos are kind of taboo these days, but they can be really useful in the right situation. So lesson five, and this is still um, a learning process about how to start the buprenorphine, whether you start um, a little bit at a time throughout the um, throughout the process, or you wait a little bit and start a, a low dose, um, or you give a lot all at once and try to give somebody ketamine in advance. To I, I had, we weren't sure what the best thing was to do, um, and uh, at this point now I'm I wait until somebody's at a point where they're likely to have less severe precipitated withdrawal on ideally day four or is really a good day and they can start their buprenorphine and uh, have have ketamine to help them um, from whatever residual withdrawal they're gonna have. And that's, that's gonna work more successfully. Okay, so this was the transition 
um, combination that worked for four people. And uh, the manuscript of the paper is going to use this um, as the as the prime example. But since I'm learning more every day, I'm going to probably talk about um, uh, other ways of doing it. Um, but this example, there were four people who made it through this transition this way, where they stopped fentanyl on day one, and they used 16 milligrams, um, a total of eight of them over the course of about three uh, of four days, and clonazepam, one milligram, four tablets. So day one and two, they did ketamine, 16 milligrams, three times um, per day, and they felt okay. On day three, they used ketamine. 16 milligrams and buprenorphine two milligrams um, four times. And uh, one of them described feeling a little shaky. Um, I, I didn't hear the, anyway, that's, that's kind of the, about the worst that um, people got of this group of four. And on day four, um, they did the same um, ketamine 16 milligrams, but started taking buprenorphine four milligrams at a time, three doses and did fine. And after that, um, that's essentially um, making it past um, precipitated withdrawal risk, and, and they're now essentially stable on buprenorphine if they choose to stay on it. Um, and for each of these four people, I'm not sure all four of them, at least uh, at least two of them ended up um, on um, in long extended release buprenorphine um, brand name Sublocade, which is for me, I think that's the pinnacle of the, if you to, to do a transition where the person ends up with a sublocate injection, then they're safe for a month. And that is, that's the ideal gold standard. So I talked about this already. Um, yeah, so ways that I think would be really cool, and I, I'm looking forward to an opportunity to try um, this use of ketamine would be to have somebody do um, macro dose on day one, like take 24 milligrams of buprenorphine pretty soon after their last fentanyl dose and precede it with ketamine. And that they know they're gonna have withdrawal, but see whether maybe it's a, a little bit less intense, maybe a lot less intense um, for some people if they use the ketamine pre-medication. And the other thing, which I, I talked about earlier, is the quick start strategy where a, pa a patient will self-administer naloxone um, in order to it precipitate a terrible withdrawal and then rec uh, rescue themselves with a high dose of buprenorphine. And whether using, if you use ketamine as pre-medication before the naloxone, that might really soften the blow and might make that uh, the gold standard. Who knows? That, that could be, and they'd be... Uh, their transition would be complete on day one. Um, the other strategy would be to use ketamine as pre-medication before um, a sublocade injection, <clears throat> because there are some clinics now that are just, when they have a person that comes into the clinic and wants to get started on, on buprenorphine, um, if you give them an injection that day, if they agree to it, they, they'll have withdrawal and feel crummy for a few days, but it's going to be over. It'll come on, I guess, for those people that have done it, it isn't as bad as having just fentanyl withdrawal for those those days because they have uh, a lot of their receptors are filled with um, buprenorphine. So um, that's the thing that's being done, and I think um, ketamine premedication before that sublocate injection um, could really be a good combination. Um, how the NMDA receptor works uh, for chronic pain and it will be very similar in terms of um, opioid tolerance and tolerance to fentanyl. Um, that when somebody has severe chronic pain, the pathway that their brain uses to remember that pain, uh, it, it happens that it gets it gets amplified, and then even a small um, exposure to pain will cause a severe reaction. And that's activated by the NMDA receptor. And if you block the NMDA receptor, then that amplification is dampened. So uh, this, the, the painful stimulation will not result in, in horrible, ex exaggerated pain any longer. Um, and this, there are pathways in the brain that represent opioid withdrawal and when somebody is using fentanyl, those pathways are amplified by the, by opioid exposure and blocking 
those pathways with the NMDA receptor will uh, block that amplification. So people won't have as severe withdrawal. Um, it, it's really complicated and I can't really do it that um, that quickly, but that's in essence to, to say it simply, it just, it blocks the pathways that the brain uses um, to manifest withdrawal symptoms. No, that's really helpful. Yeah. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, that's good. I think that's okay. really good. Okay. So, um, and yeah, withdrawal is awful and even ketamine doesn't do it for everybody. And I don't know why um, it does it for some people and not others. And it may be a matter of timing. <clears throat> it may be um, a matter of wh whether the person also has xylosine in their system or if they're also withdrawing from methamphetamines at the same time, or if they're still using methamphetamines or if they're still using fentanyl, but not telling me that's what they're using. There's any number of reasons that somebody could have terrible withdrawal despite using ketamine. Um, but uh, it's not it's not a guaranteed method, uh, I have to say. So I just would like to, um, in the future, help other people implement this treatment in the range of settings that they're in. And there's a number of different groups that I have been talking with across the country that are trying it in small ways in their own setting and moving gingerly because a lot of times people are in organizations that have a lot of administration, administrative oversight and are not very quick to take on uh, new, new techniques and strategies. Um, and if anyone is interested in doing formal research on this, I would love to participate and help you design a study that might demonstrate how this can be a, an effective tool. All right, I am ready if you have questions. Yeah, that's that's so generous of you. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, the biggest question I have, because I want to implement this like as soon as possible. I had a patient just about two weeks ago who really wanted, she, we had tried and tried and tried every single method possible to get her onto buprenorphine from fentanyl and she was failing. And then we tried methadone and she didn't like methadone because we're at an OTP as well as an OBOT. And so she just said, just give me sublocate, just give it to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're going to have such bad withdrawal. In fact, I talked to Darlene about it. I'm like, I just am so worried about her. And she did, she had awful withdrawal and I wished I had had some ketamine accessible. And so my question was, I mean, I live in a rural area. There's no compounding pharmacy anywhere near. And I had talked to her about it and she was like, how can I get ketamine? And I'm like, well, we'd have to order it from a mail order, compounding pharmacy and weight and, you know, all of those things. So I'm just wondering how we actually get it. You spoke about this, but um, you prescribe it to the patient, obviously, like you do any compounded medication, but then it takes some time to get it. Or do you prescribe it and through your DEA and have it at your OTP and hold it there as a locked medication and then dispense it to each patient as an order? How do you do it? Yeah, so I am not physically at the OTP, and actually Tom Hutch looked into really carefully into the uh, DEA regulations to see whether there was some possible corner of the regulations that would allow holding it on site, and there was no way to do it um, because it's just it's just not allowed to be. Um, it's not one of the medications that's allowed on, on by the federal regulations. Um, so. Uh, for those, most of the patients, they ended up going and picking it up at the pharmacy or being driven to the pharmacy by somebody, a staff member. Um, and uh, that's when the pharmacy is already expecting it and they have the trochies ready. Well, for the other patients that I've been dealing with, I have a number of patients that have um, I've taken care of right in Olympia in my own community. And they come in and they're ready that day. And they don't, I don't have any pharmacy that's made up all these trophies, but I do have a pharmacy that's willing to make up syrup, which is 16 milligrams per milliliter. And that actually works great. It's just as effective as the trochee and it can be made the same day. And uh, this particular pharmacy that I work with is willing to make up the eight um, milliliters for uh, $25. So the, again, since I'm, I'm billing Medicaid and I can pay the $25 out of my reimbursement, which is meager reimbursement, but at least it's, a, it's enough. And so the patient doesn't have to pay for it. So in your really remote environment where there is no compounding pharmacy, you might, you can order it and you'd have to, there's DEA regulations that allow you to keep it on site in a, in a locked safe. Do you have 
locked safes? Uh, do you have a locked safe for other controlled substances? We do outside of, so we have an OTP and then we have a general clinic as well because we're CC, we're, we're a CCBHC type model clinic. So we, we could do that. Yeah. I spoke to our pharmacist about it and he was just like, hell, like, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> but like he was saying, the administrative, I think was, I scare him sometimes with some of the things I want to do, but it's, it sounds like if we ordered it, but if you order it, do you have to prescribe it to yeah. one person or? That's exactly the problem with compounding pharmacies. They are under their own tight um, regulations and restrictions and they have to, um, they can only dispense it to a person um, that a single person that is being made for. So they can't give you like a bunch of trochies to hold in your safe. Um, but what you can do is you can get a vial of liquid ketamine that's from a pharmaceutical grade. Um, and you can buy that through some kind of a wholesale distributor. And one, one strategy would be to give somebody an IM dose of that. And uh, you wouldn't be able to send them home with it. To um, you, you could have that, you could mix it yourself with um, cherry syrup. I think it's pretty bitter tasting, um, but I don't think that that would be illegal. And that is one strategy. If you wanna be, you know, you'd have to be pretty sophisticated to get the right concentration. And I'm not sure I would try that myself, but I might I might be willing to do um, an injection and I would do, there's one one of the um, people I'm working with or that's, that's giving it a try in, in New Jersey, Anthony Accurso, um, who has an inpatient uh, withdrawal uh, management program, and he's given people 10 milligrams IM and had some pretty good results. Not not 100%. Some, sometimes it doesn't do much, and other times it's it's really been wonderful um, and everything in between. Um, so that's the amount that, that he's chosen to use, and that's equivalent to probably 40 milligrams sublingual. There's the, uh, It's hard to come up with an exact ratio. There's a variety of statistics that are published on on the bioavailability of sublingual ketamine. But 10 milligrams IM, if you're just going to give one dose before it, the sublocade, um, that, that's probably a good amount to give. And if you do it, please do it and then tell me what happens and, and I can work with you on that. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. It's, it's it, like you said, we're just trying to keep, you know, like you've worked in the past in low barrier clinics and that's the model is to try and help people right in the moment when they need help. But it sounds like just with some planning, maybe we could contract with the compounded pharmacy and get them to overnight mail it too. So we'll, we'll work on some options and I'll keep you updated. Oh. And also, I mean, I when you were talking about methadone inductions too, I've run into this problem with getting people stabilized on methadone quickly enough when they're coming, transitioning from fentanyl and they're so uncomfortable um, and obviously, you know, per federal guidelines and just safety, you can't just slam them with high doses of methadone. So this would be very helpful for those patients as well. So that's, yeah, that's the two that I tried it with for methadone. It, it worked beautifully. Yeah. Okay. So interesting. So Cindy, just to address, I know you get this question a lot, but to address the big, you know, the elephant in the room, how do you answer the question about the the safety around prescribing something that's potentially addictive to somebody who already has an addiction. And then on that same line, like, do you worry about diversion with these patients, especially, you know, these ones that you're sending home with these trochies or the liquid that you talk about? Yeah, I do. I get that question a lot. And I thought about it in advance because yeah, it, that's something that I would worry about also. So I deliberately only provide the eight milliliters or eight trochies. And if somebody decided, I mean, most of the time, somebody that's coming to you asking for help is probably not going to waste it and or give it away. Um, they're probably going to want to use it as directed so that they can get the benefit. But even if they did or somebody stole it from them or whatever and took all eight of them all at once, they might have one amazing psychedelic trip, and then that'd be the end of it. So it's not a big risk for diversion or, or, um, or safety. Um, the, the bigger thing I'm wrestling with is that a lot of these people actually would benefit by continuing to use it for their PTSD type symptoms and their depression and their chronic pain. Um, and one of the patient I just started with last week, actually, I did agree to write a prescription for her for another seven days because um, 
is she was anyway, she was still feeling kind of icky and it might be that I will continue. She's a pretty responsible person and you have to judge each person individually. And that's how I've done it with my 600 patients. I just, I won't give it to anybody that I have some doubt about or if there's lack of trust. And probably there's some that's being diverted, but those I'm giving somebody a month at a time. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of it is is getting to somebody else, but not very much because these people really benefit from it and they want to, they don't want to lose that benefit by giving it to somebody else. So back to this anxiety. So it doesn't seem to address the anxiety with withdrawal that you've noted. And I just had this question and I don't know, is this anxiety that you're observing during that kind of induction phase, is it all just from withdrawal or is it the ketamine emergence syndrome that we observe? Is is that what we're seeing? Is that even an issue on this ultra low dose ketamine? Um, I don't think it's an issue. On this ultra low dose ketamine, I never actually thought about that. Um, although most people that have been through fentanyl withdrawal, they know that anxiety is a pretty yeah. big component of it. So any amount, I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't think about ketamine uh, withdrawal or you know the post. No, that that's just not. It doesn't happen at that. Dose. We're not in, in fentanyl withdrawal. So yeah, the anxiety is specifically withdrawal yeah. from fentanyl or precipitated withdrawal. And is there any, do- so uh, the buprenorphine, preci- so precipitated withdrawal, and is there, do you use a different ketamine dose for that versus your pre-medicating ketamine dose, or is it the same? Well, I, I've just settled on 16 milligrams, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes if people are are a little wary for some reason, they might start with eight, and I'll say, okay, just take a half of a trophy if that's what you want to do. Um, but, um, the, usually the people that use eight, they might get some benefit, but it doesn't last that long. And so they have to do the other eight Mm -hmm. and why not just do all 16 all at once, because you're still not going to have any perception cognition changes and, um, it's just more convenient to do it once. Any like specific patients that you would have concerns or you'd recommend either not using this in like any contraindications with ketamine? Yeah, originally I thought I wouldn't want anybody that doesn't have a safe place to stay. But you know, I don't I don't honestly think there's a reason not to do it anymore because the person's going to be miserable going through fentanyl withdrawal anyway. Mm-hmm. And this is something that's going to make their life a little easier even if they are living in a tent in the woods um you know and by themselves. I mean, the worst that happens is they lose you know, they're so confused and so upset, they take it all at once and they're not going to, it's not dangerous. You know, like I said, unless you're in a swimming pool and you drown, which I mean, a bad rap. And it wasn't yeah. this stupid coroner that made that, you know, said that acute toxic effects of ketamine was what killed him. That's, that's ridiculous. You know, it wasn't, it was drowning and it was just provocative that he phrased it that way. Yeah, it's been it's been interesting to bring ketamine into light in that way um, and to talk about it. I mean, I guess we've we've had we did an episode before on ketamine, you know, as a drug of abuse and people who use it and abuse it. And that's certainly something to talk about. But for this purpose, you're using it as a you know medication with a real therapeutic endpoint at a very low dose and it's given in a monitored manner. So not to be, you know, confused with people who are using ketamine in an addictive manner with compulsive use and cravings and negative consequences. Yeah. So just to be clear, we have a lot of listeners who are not medical, you know, not necessarily medical providers. So there's a distinction there between providing ketamine for something like this, which is just linking people to life-saving care versus enabling someone in an addiction and giving them basically a drug that they've been abusing and using at much, much higher doses, which is a totally different story. That was beautifully yeah. stated. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This is just not um, enough for somebody to become addicted to. Um, and they, uh, so there, ha- there are people that are not finished at, after four days, they've used all eight trochies. And I've been like at first thinking, well, I don't know, what do I do now? But I've given them another eight. And so I, I kind of just decided that that's going to be my limit of how many I would give at any one time. Because beyond that, it really, 
can put somebody into a, I mean, they could, I don't want anybody to go into the K-hole, which is like a really extreme state of basically anesthesia. Um, so I, I don't want to take that risk. And I think a maximum of, of eight times 16 milligrams is probably the extreme end of what, if somebody took it all at once, um, I, I think would be relatively safe and safe. You know, it's a relative term. It's really it's not going to kill them no matter. It's really, you can't overdose on ketamine. So that's not going to be the problem. But anyway, I, I think I don't want people to use too much of it at once, even by accident. Sure. Well, it's, it's really exciting to hear that there are more options. I think, you know, we're in an age that's really, I mean, it's dire. And we're all in this situation where we just want to be part of this movement that allows people greater access to the treatment that they deserve and that, can help them live better lives and prevent them from dying from an overdose. So really grateful that this is an option and we hope that there's more things that anytime something else comes out around initiation onto MOUD or other options, I think we're all excited about this. So we're really grateful that you shared this. And I know I was really touched at CSAM when you were just like, if anyone needs help, just message me. I was like, this is incredible to have you on so available. So thank you. And thank you for being on the podcast. I think this will be really valuable for our listeners. Thank you so much for the opportunity to spread the word about this. And I hope that people will take me up on that offer and give it a try. And Until next time. Hey, check us out at theaddictionfiles.com or email us at theaddictionfiles at gmail.com. Thank you so much to Ricky Valides for use of his song, Awake. Check him out at rickyvalides.com. purposes only. Hosts and guests are not responsible for any harm caused by information obtained from this source. As each person is unique, you're advised to seek the advice of your own healthcare professional to treat any medical conditions you may be having. Opinions expressed on the show are those of the addiction files and not of our respective employers.